th this feels like home for me. It's good to be here. Praise God. Uh, I'm uh, really thankful to the Lord for, for all of you. Um, I'm thankful to, to be here worshiping with the saints of God. And uh, you, you don't have to go through a system to become a saint someday in 200 years. You can be a saint right now. Believe in Christ and you're a saint. Um, so I, I, this, is, this is home. I'm glad to be here. And it, it has, uh, y'all have blessed me um, for years. And even this morning to, to be here with you and to see uh, how so many of you want to want to share and want to speak to what God is doing in your life. And you want to take what, what God has given to you and, and be a blessing to others. And uh, so I'm, I'm thankful to be here and, and just wanted to share a little bit of that with you. It was um, after we were getting towards the end of the songs and I'm looking at the time and I'm going, I mean, it's only like. 10.30, I, I'm not going to preach an hour and a half. Why are we? And then everybody preached something. I'm like, okay, all right, there we go. That's a little bad. I, I would have I felt bad if I was going to have to preach for an hour and a half. I don't know what I was going to say. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you all for, for ministering and for sharing. And uh, I'm, I'm blessed to be here. Would you pray with, him, with me this morning before we uh, dive into the Lord's word a little bit and minister that? Father, we come to you in the name, character, and righteousness of your son, Jesus, by faith uh, in the blood that was shed at Calvary. And Lord, it's with uh, steadfast hope in Christ that we have boldness to come to you. And Father, we take delight in you. Lord, we love you because you first loved us. And so, Father, this morning as we get into your word, this morning, Lord, as we mine truth, uh, from what you have to say to us. We just pray, Lord God, uh, that you would speak to our hearts, every one of us, Lord. I pray, Father, that you would speak by the Holy Spirit, Lord, because uh, not a one of us knows what's going on in the heart and life of, of another. Uh, Lord, your word says that the heart is deceitful above all else and desperately wicked. Uh, we can deceive ourselves, Lord, uh, but when you speak, you know truth. And so, Father, that's what we pray today. We pray, Lord, that you administer life to the hearer. And I pray, Lord, that uh, every one of us would hear from your word as it is from you. And, Lord, that it would not be uh, a man's opinion or uh, that it would not exalt man but Christ. We pray your blessing, Lord, on every one of us in here this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 I am... Uh, uh, last night I was a little bit nervous about this, and this morning, the more I'm thinking and praying, I just started getting real excited to come and to be here with you, uh, to open up the Lord's Word. Uh, God said in Exodus 34 that He is rich in mercy, and He is slow to anger. The God that we serve, uh, He is well pleased with the praises of His people. Amen? Amen? Anybody happy about that? And so I'm thinking about who God is, and I'm thinking about how He wants to speak to us, and how He wants to bless His people, and how He, how he shows Himself kind and faithful and merciful. And I'm just getting excited to come up here and to worship the Lord with you, and, and to, to look into His Word, and to see what the Lord might say to us this morning. So we're going we're gonna to look at 2 Corinthians 4 today, and we'll be there for, there's a couple other kind of cross-references, but we're going to be in 2 Corinthians 4. And as I looked at this passage of Scripture, it looks to me as though it kind of divides into what I would call three sections, all right? And the first one kind of goes about verses 1 through, we'll say 6 or 7, and then through, I think it's about like... 14 or 15, and then the last three. So in these three sections, in the first one, the Apostle Paul is uh, talking about the advancement of the gospel, okay? And he's talking about how when light comes into the world and, and when, the, when the light of the gospel shines onto people. And then in the second one, uh, Paul, Paul in... He had come to Corinth, and he had shared the gospel, and these people believe, and then he leaves to go share the gospel in another place. And when Paul leaves, other people come in, and they start talking bad about Paul, and they start talking bad about the, the trials of life that he's been through and all the things that's been going on. And Paul speaks to uh, the trials that he's gone through and what the purpose of that was. And I think that'll really minister to us. And then in the kind of the last section, uh, it's a little perspective and a little bit of hope, okay? So let's just take a look at some of these things this morning. 
Start in verse 1. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world, and that's speaking about Satan, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light, and so you can see through here, he's talking about the gospel coming and the ministry that they brought and how they brought the ministry, and now he's talking about light. In whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And so I see in here one, that last verse there, verse 6, uh, Paul, he, he, get, he likes to get real excited. Amen. Anybody get excited thinking about the Lord? He likes to get real excited and say things like this. For God who hath commanded the light to shine out of the darkness hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. That's a mouthful, right? But you slow down and you read that and you can just see the excitement of Paul speaking about the glory of Christ who has shined into his, life, into his heart and life. So a couple things here. One, the ministry of the gospel. We're talking about Paul being very open when he brought the gospel forth. There was nothing hidden. Nothing was done in the shadows. Nothing was done in the darkness, but everything was done in the light. And then he speaks about the light of Christ coming. And verse 1, and I heard this a bunch of times this morning, including in that word that our brother had shared with us, talking about mercy. And then from Psalm 118, he was talking about God's mercy again and again and again. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, okay, this is, this is more important than, uh, than we've got time for. This is more important than we've got time for this morning. If we're going to preach anything besides verse 1, then, then we don't get to do due diligence to this verse. As we have received mercy, this, this all extends from this short phrase. Paul's speaking about his ministry. As we have received mercy, we faint not. Okay, saints, be encouraged about this. Everything in your walk with the Lord flows from grace and mercy. If you are apart from Christ, the only grace of God in your life is if you're apart from Christ, the only grace of God in your life is that He has not yet given you the judgment that you deserve. If you're apart from Christ, the only good thing in your life is that you have not yet had to face the judgment of God. But if you are in Christ, God's wrath has been... The Bible says that Christ is our atonement. He is the propitiation for our sins. That means that the wrath of God has been satisfied. If you are in Christ, there is zero wrath left for you. Amen. Jesus paid it half. No. Not at all. Jesus paid it all. You have got to let this sink deep, 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 deep into your heart. Why did Paul do what he did? He said, we faint not. Why? Look at all of the things that he went through. How was he able to endure that? How was he able to go through all that suffering? How was he able to take the gospel into a place where no one had known Christ? How was he able to go to a place knowing they're going to try and kill him? Because of the mercy of God. If you are in Christ... Rest in the assurance of that and know that the wrath of God has been propitiated. It is satisfied. Jesus paid it all. Can I get an amen? amen. Can I get an amen? amen? Somebody get excited that you will never face the wrath of God. Amen. There's no wrath for you. None. Jesus paid it all. 
Okay, I can just say that over and over and over again until we're just done preaching. Until it's time to go home. That is good news. And if you, if you lose sight of that, you will, you'll, you'll totter, you'll stumble, you'll fall. If you lose sight of the fact that God has no wrath for you, you'll not be able to live the Christian life. You have got to trust in Christ. Look to Christ. And, and the verses uh, in, in, at the end of chapter 3 before that speak to that. The, 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 in the, the Israelites, they're still trying to earn their way to God by fulfilling the law. But Christ has pierced the veil. And so the veil for us has been removed. There's no veil. Christ has pierced the veil. We can walk right into the Holy of Holies, right into the presence of God through the blood of Christ. Thank you, you can have boldness to come to Christ, not on the basis of your performance, but on the basis of the name, character, and righteousness of Christ. Amen. 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 Somebody get excited. That's got to go deep into you. That's got to go deep into you. That if you are in Christ, there's no wrath. If you're outside of Christ, the only grace of God in your life is that you haven't faced judgment yet and that He has still given you time to repent. But if you're in Christ, don't faint. We faint not. You can be bold in Christ. Okay, let's continue. We can preach that forever. That's got to go so deep into you. That's got to go so deep into you that no matter what happens around you, it, it can't be shaken. Understanding that you are in Christ. Understanding that you have not heard about mercy. That mercy isn't just a theory for you. That you have received mercy and that you stand in the name of Christ. You can face anything in the name of Christ because you know that you've received mercy. Amen. That's got to go deep into you. Okay. Continuing, verse 2, But have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. I just got fired up with somebody just recently. He's talking about how do we appeal to people to come to Christ, okay? And, and my, my point in this is that when we share the gospel, it has to be in openness, so there's, a, there's something that they call relational evangelism, and that's basically I build a relationship with you for the purpose of sharing the gospel with you. And then there's, there's more of a style of, like, you know, if I've talked to you for 10 seconds, you're going to hear the gospel, okay? And now if, if God has called you, wired you, God's given you a personality for one or the other, praise God. Amen? Amen. Praise God, because you're advancing the gospel. You're giving hope and life to people. But... When Paul did this, he did not do it in dishonesty. He, he has renounced hidden things. He's not walking in craftiness nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but openly. So this is not, if you're going to do relational evangelism, at some point you have to get to the gospel. Amen? Yeah. You, you can build a relationship with people all you want, but at some point you have to get to the gospel. And you have to be, you have to be open. And you have to open your mouth and say something, okay? Otherwise, you're doing the exact opposite of verse 2 here. The, the, you, you can deceive somebody into thinking that all you want is a friendship, when in the back of your mind, you know the reason you're doing this is so that someday you can share the gospel with them. And so you're just building this friendship and building this friendship and building this friendship, and then years later, you finally get to the point where you go, here's the gospel. And they're like, what? what? You know, you're totally catching them off guard. So at some point, just share Christ with them. Amen? Amen. Okay. Now, because then he says this, if our gospel is hidden, it's hidden to them that are lost. All right? And now here's, here's a little bit of motivation for you in sharing the gospel with people. In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. Why don't people believe? Why are there so many people who, who don't care about the Lord? Why are there so many people who don't want to be in church, who don't want to praise the Lord, who aren't thankful, who aren't grateful, they're selfish? Why are there so many people like that? In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not. Because Satan has blinded them. There's no light, just darkness. They're blinded. Lest the light... Because if he hadn't, otherwise the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who's the image of God, should shine unto them. We've got to share the light. 
show the light of Christ. Verse 6, for God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness. When God created the world, it was just darkness. Then He creates the world and He commands the light to shine out of darkness. And in the same way, He hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God. To give the light. So we were, at one point, we were all children of darkness, children of wrath, walking apart from God. We didn't care about the things of the Lord. Maybe you came to Christ at 4 or 44. But at one point, you are separated from God, and the light shined into the darkness of your heart. And God brought to, to, to light, spiritual life in Christ. Amen? Amen. Are you thankful for that? Amen. Amen. All right. So this is, this is kind of the first section, talking about the openness of, of Paul in his ministry, that he didn't walk in craftiness. So he, Paul had, had come, and these people get born again. They're trusting in Christ. He leaves to go share the gospel somewhere else. And other people come in, and they start talking bad about Paul. And, and, and they're using deceitfulness, and they're using craftiness, and they're twisting words and saying different things. And Paul says, hey, what are you doing listening to these guys? When I came to you, it was just open. I just shared Christ with you, and the light of God shined onto you, and you believed. Amen. Don't listen to those guys. That's what he's saying. He's, he's trying to defeat enemies who are coming in and trying to, uh, to disturb the church and trying to turn things upside down. Okay. Um, then he gets into... We're working on, working on time here a little bit. You're trying good. to say it all. You're good. Okay. Preach. Preach, Preach on. Preach. That's, what, that's what everybody says, huh? Preach. Nobody Nobody's hungry. Nobody wants to go eat lunch. <laughs> This, this, is, this is man. This is man. All right. All right. Um, Lord, give us our, our daily bread. Amen. Amen. Our daily bread. We need to, it's, it's a daily walk with the Lord, not a, not a weekly Sunday morning walk with the Lord. Right. Give us our daily bread, not our weekly bread. Amen. Amen. When God led the Israelites out of Egypt and uh, they complained they didn't have anything to eat, what did he do? He gave them manna and he said, you got to pick it up every day. And some of them tried to pick it up for the next day, too. And that turned rotten. Well, bugs got in there. And your, your spiritual life is not pray the prayer and then live on a prayer, one prayer for the rest of your spiritual life. It's a daily walk with the Lord. You try to, you try to eat, eat yesterday's manna. You try to rest on last year's manna. And you'll find that it's gone rotten on you. We need to have a, a daily walk of communing and fellowship with Christ. Amen. Okay, in the second section, Paul speaks to uh, that his enemies were trying to distort the church and distract him and believe in other things because of the trials and things that Paul had been through. And so Paul, Paul says, okay, you want to talk about the stuff that I've gone through? Let me tell you about those things. Let me tell you about the purpose of God in that. And this should minister to you, saints, okay? Anybody ever gone through a trial? Anybody ever wondered, God, why have you led me into this? Aren't I supposed to have victory all the time? What's going on here? Well, Paul went through it too, and here's what he says about the purpose of trials. Let's read a little bit, starting in verse 8. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. For we which live are always delivered unto death, for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. So then death worketh in us, but life in you. We having the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believed, and therefore I have spoken. We also believe and therefore speak, knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise us, raise up us also by Jesus, and shall present us with you. <coughs> Amen. Amen. Okay. Here's a little bit about, about what Paul's saying here. In, in verse 7, he says, We have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. So we've got to understand that, that as uh, 
as we're going to advance the gospel and as we're walking in faith, it is for the glory of God and not for man. And you, you see that when we go through temptations and we go through trials and we go through struggles and we make it through and, and people can look at you and say, how have you made it through this? And you, you get a chance to point to Christ. Uh, I've got a, a dear brother, his name's Robbie Trent, and he works for the Fellowship of Christian Athletes at the University of Nebraska. And this past year, he met one-on-one uh, -on -one with every Nebraska football coach. And so he has a, a personal relationship, a personal ministry with him. And say what you want about Mike Riley's quality as a football coach and his leadership of the Nebraska football team, but that man knows Christ. And the, the ministry that he had to everyone around him when everyone knew he was going to get fired. You want to talk about a trial. You want to talk about adversity. He's the most public figure in the state of Nebraska. And he was going through trials and adversity uh, when, when Nebraska got rolled at Minnesota. He and his wife were holding hands walking out of the stadium and you can't believe the things that Nebraska fans were saying to him and about him and about his character and the kind of person that he was. And Mike Riley's steadfast faith in Christ allowed him to let that stuff just roll off of him. And that is an unbelievably tense work environment. It's unbelievably pressure filled. And all those men around him, young men, maybe 18, all the way up to all the coaches working with him, they saw what was in him because of his steadfast faith in Christ. And how, how is he able to do that? How is he able to handle that pressure? Even the media could see it. They could see that there was something different about this guy. And it was Christ in him, the hope of glory. Amen. That was how he was able to, to fulfill verse 8. We're troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We're perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. And a, a, a few other things that I think sometimes as, as Christian people, I, I stole a line from Dave Ramsey. People ask me, how are you doing, Steve? And what do I say, <laughs> Mrs. Meyer? <laughs> you remember that? <clears throat> Better than I deserve. That's the line. That's what I say all the time. Better than I deserve. Well, honestly, sometimes in, in Christian circles, we just pretend like everything's okay. You, you, you fight with the missus or, or the husband on the way into church, and then you get into church and you sm start smiling, right? Because you're a Christian, so everything's supposed to be good all the time, right? We, we, we tend to think like that. We tend to think like, well, I mean, I, I get there and all those other people, they're all happy and smiling all the time, and I guess I'm supposed to be too. And so we, we, we do, in fact, the very opposite of the gospel. The gospel calls us to say to the Lord, I have sinned. I've screwed up. I'm not perfect. I need you to fix me. And then we come to church and we say, I got it all together. We face that temptation, do we not? Do you ever face the temptation to look to other people like everything's okay? So sometimes when I say I'm better than I deserve, well, you know, the situations and circumstances of life, I say that because those things might not be the greatest. But, but I know that I am better than I deserve because I, I, I'm, I'm a sinner saved by grace. So the circumstances of life might not be what I'd like, but I am better than I deserve. And so that's my first answer because most people, they aren't really asking you that. It's pleasantries, which is fine. I'm not upset about that at all. But what, what this is calling us to is let's, let's do what Paul did in verses 8 and 9. He says, we're troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We're perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. So I think what this is calling us to is honesty, but with hope. So in, in whatever circumstance of life you're going in, call it what it is, be honest. But you, but you can't just, just stay there in the pits of despair. There's also got to be hope in this. He even says that, talking about despair. We're perplexed, but not in despair. You don't have to understand everything that's going on in life, but you've got to trust that Christ knows 
Don't despair of what's happening in your life. You can be perplexed. You don't have to understand everything, but you have to hope in Christ. You have to trust in Christ. Amen? Amen. 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 Let's be honest. Let's be honest, but let's have hope. The, uh, the hope is what we stand on. And, but, we, but we've got to be honest with the Lord, and that means honest in our life. All right, there's, there's the note from verses 8 and 9. And in verse 10, here's another one for you, okay? Be encouraged by this. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. So here's, here's, what, I'm, here's what I'm seeing as I, as I interact with various groups of believers and, and churches and groups and ministries and all sorts of things. We have a, a temptation to skip the first part, always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus. We have a tendency to skip that to try to get straight to that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. In, in the Christian life, it comes life after death. The, you, you, can't, you can't have Jesus as Savior without having Jesus as Lord. You can't know Christ without repenting and turning away from sin. And we, ha we, want, we want all the benefits of a life in Christ with none of the cost. And, and, and Paul talking about his ministry to other people, here's what he's saying. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus. We're, we're, us as servants of Christ are not above our master. If Christ had to suffer in life, we're going to go through suffering too. If Christ had to go through trials, we're going to go through trials too. Amen. And, and you, can't, you can't shortcut your way around that. And if you, if you are, are constantly looking just for, uh, and, and we all face this temptation in a number of different ways, you're, you're in a situation and you want just out of it right now. You want out of it right now. Um, you're going through something and, and where, do you, where do you turn to just get out of it in the moment? Maybe it's TV. Maybe it's food. Um, maybe it's just an outbur a quick outburst of anger. You, you don't know how to handle a situation. And so instead of going through the test from the Lord, bearing about in your body the dying of the Lord Jesus and, and putting off the old man, instead of putting off the old man, we just react out of the new man or we just feed the flesh for the moment because it feels good in the moment. And we don't bear about in our body the dying of the Lord Jesus so that the life of Christ might also be made manifest in our body. There, there's no shortcuts in the, in the Christian life. If Jesus had to go through that stuff, then we do too. Amen? Amen? Let's follow our Lord, even to the cross. Let's follow Christ. Let's treasure Christ, even to the cross. And why he brought this up was to, he's writing to the Corinthian people, remember? And he left, and then somebody else comes in and tries to pull him away from what Paul was teaching him. In verse 11, he says this, and continuing, For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. So then, death worketh in us, but life in you. Would Paul have made it to Corinth if every time he faced temptation, instead of bearing about in his body the death of Christ, would Paul have made it to Corinth to carry the gospel to them if every time he faced temptation, he just, I, I'm not going through this one. I'm not, I'm not going through this one. I, oh, he, he wouldn't have made it. So verse 12, so then death worketh in us, but life in you. The, you, you as you bear about in your body the death of Christ and are willing to endure reproach with Christ so that the life of Christ might be made manifest in you, you then have the life of Christ in you to give to others. So this is the purpose. This is the purpose of the trials that Paul was going through. This is the purpose of the trials and temptations and tests that you're going through. As you go through these things, you're, you're going through the same path that Christ went through, suffering and being reviled for the name of Christ in the same way that he was, so that the life of Christ might be made manifest in you and then given then to others as well. This is, this is there's no shortcuts in this. There's no shortcuts in this. If we, um, man, how's that one go? Galatians 6, anybody help me out with that one? He, he that... 
If you sow to the flesh, you'll reap of the flesh. Sow to the Spirit, and you'll reap of the Spirit life everlasting. Amen? It's a, a, a principle throughout the Word of God that if, if we sow to our flesh, instead of putting to death the old man, that's what we're going to reap. I, I got an analogy that I like to ask with, with people. Um, but I got an apple here, okay? And I squeeze this apple really hard. How much orange juice am I going to get? Not by not a whole lot. <laughs> Same thing for you, Christian. When, when the pressure is applied to you, what comes out of you is what's inside of you. And if you are sowing to the flesh, when the pressure is applied, what will come out? The flesh. But if you sow to the Spirit, when the pressure is applied, what will come out of you? The Spirit. The life of Christ. And so as we, as we set our, as, as we, going way back to verse 1, we have this ministry as we have received mercy. And so with, with big picture things, Paul likes to get into big picture things. With big picture things, we think about eternal things. Where would you be apart from the grace of Christ? Where would you be apart from the mercy of Christ in your life? Well, in, in eternity, separated from God in hell. Given, given over to our own desires, which is everything anti-Christ. But God being rich in mercy. And so motivated, motivated by mercy. We love because He first loved us. Because of the love of God, we're willing to follow Christ. Even when it means bearing about in our own bodies the death of Christ. Okay, let's go to 14. Knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus and shall present us with you. For all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God. For which cause we faint not. But though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. 14. This is the promise. This is the promise. Knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus. Okay, how did Jesus come out of the grave? Holy Spirit, right? Holy Spirit rose Christ from the grave, and he that, that uh, dwells in him now dwells in us. So the promise of God is knowing that He which raised up the Lord Jesus. Do you know that? Do you believe that? Are you standing in that? Okay, now here's the promise. He also shall raise us up by Jesus and shall present us. So he, us with you, Paul and the Corinthians, and by extension, you and I. We will be presented to God in Christ, in the righteousness of Christ. This is the promise. So here's the question. Why did Jesus come to earth? We're, we're getting into Advent, the Christmas season. God became a human being, Emmanuel, and dwelt among us. Why did Jesus come to earth? Why did Jesus die? Why couldn't... This, so this is, this is a, little bit of, a little bit of theology stuff here for you, okay? Why couldn't God just look down and say, I forgive you? Why did Christ have to die? He was our co -sign. To fulfill the law. That was a good one, yeah. Why did Christ have to die? Because God is, God is not just sometimes, and then He changes His mind and decides to be gracious other times. God is always just, meaning He does the right thing. God has never done anything wrong. He is morally perfect, but He's also rich in kindness and mercy and grace. How, how can He be holy, righteous, and just, and kind, and merciful, and gracious at the same time? Because He doesn't change His mind and go from one to the other and to the other. Because if God did that, then sometimes He would do that to you. If God did that, sometimes He would do that to you. Sometimes He would choose to be gracious to you, and other times He would choose to be wrathful towards you. And you would never know what you were going to get. 
Can you imagine dealing with our Heavenly Father like that? That some days you wake up and God decides to be wrathful. Some days you wake up and God decides to be gracious. But He's not. He's all of these things at the same time. And so how can God look at you and I in our sin and love us? How can He do that? He can't without Christ. This is why Jesus came. This is why Jesus died. Because God took all of the wrath, all, that you and I deserve and poured it on Christ. And it was, it was so horrific that when Christ was on the cross, the Bible says that the whole earth became dark for three hours. When God poured out the wrath that you and I deserve on Christ, when He poured that out on Christ, it was so horrific, so disturbing, so ugly. What you and I deserve is so bad that God turned His face away from the entire earth for three hours. He couldn't even look at His Son. That's, that's who we are apart from Christ. And so God, being rich in mercy, poured out His wrath on Christ so that He could receive us in the name and character and righteousness of Jesus. Well, that sounds amazing. How do I get in on that? How do I have God deal with me in mercy and grace and kindness and not in wrath and justice? Turn from your wicked ways. Repent and trust in Christ. Having, have, how many times do you have to murder before you've broken the law? One, how do you unmurder people? Have you broken the law of God? Are you, are, you, are you with sin? Is there sin in your life? Absolutely. You can't unbreak the law and you can't work your way back to Christ. The only way for us to be received by God is not to hope that we can do good and He's going to say, sure, I forgive you, that's good enough. The only way for you and I to be received by God is for God to look at Christ when He sees us. So turn from sin, repent, change your mind. Turn from sin and trust in Christ. And then, like verse 1, having received mercy. At that point, there's no more wrath. In the heart of God toward you, child of God, now child of God. It is, when Jesus hung on the cross, one of the last things he said was, It is almost finished. You just have to work a little harder. No, it is finished. Jesus didn't say, It's almost finished. Now you just got to pray through. Now you just got to witness to more people. Now you just got to show up in church and pay your tithe. And then you get it. He said, it's finished. The work is done. Trust in the finished work of Christ. And then let that sink deeply into your soul. Let that minister grace and life to you, knowing that the wrath of God is done. It's over. There's no more wrath of God for you. And let that mercy that you have received so fill your heart with a desire to worship that when you look at the trials in your life, you see purpose in them. Amen. That when you see the stuff that you're going through, you see it with an eternal mindset, knowing that an eternal God poured out His wrath on Christ so that you then could go through that. And other people would look at you and they would be encouraged. And they go, how does he do that? How does she do that? How did Mike Riley do that? Because of an enduring hope in Christ. There is purpose in every aspect of your life. God is not lost. He's not confused by anything that you're going through. There's purpose in it, and He wants to use it for His glory, for your good, and for the blessing of many others. Amen. Okay. Whew. All right, here we go. 14. This is the promise. This is the promise. Knowing that He which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also. Amen. That's a promise. Yeah. There's, that's not conditional. If you're in Christ, you'll be raised up. Amen. That good news, anybody? Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. It's done. Now live out the salvation you've been given. And Paul says, 
for all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace, abundant grace, might through the thanksgiving of many. Can you give thanks? Can the many that are here give thanks for the abundant grace of God, that this might redound to the glory of God? God is worthy of the worship of all of creation. And as you think about the mercy that you've received, as you think about the wrath of God being propitiated, it's satisfied, it's done. As you think about those things, it should fill our hearts with thanksgiving. That that might redound to the glory of God. Don't you want to see God glorified? Don't you want to see Him worshipped? Amen. Yes. Amen. Listen, this is sometimes in, sometimes in church, we start looking around and we go, where is everybody? There's not enough people here. Or you, we start to make excuses on why we're a small church or, you know, well, there used to be, the, or, oh, so-and-so's gone. Or we start caring so much about what other people see. Let your hearts be tethered to Christ. Remembering the mercy of God that you have received, that you could worship God in a, in a solitary confinement. Yeah. And you wouldn't be upset that there's only one in there. Let your heart be so tethered to Christ that you'll praise Him no matter who's around. Amen. It, it doesn't matter who shows up. You want them all to show up, but it doesn't matter. God is worthy of worship. Look at what He's done in your life and be thankful. And press on. And keep going. Keep giving thanks. Keep glorifying the Lord. <coughs> okay, so I think I came up with a new line instead of um, when people ask me, I, I never remember to say it, but I got a new line. We'll see if I can remember to say it someday. Instead of I'm doing better than I deserve, here, here's, here's my new line. How you doing? What, what's going on? What's, what's happening? My line is I'm getting ready for heaven. Let's, let's live our lives getting ready for heaven. Amen. Be excited about that. That's good news, right? And I saw that in verse 16 as well. Talking about the glory of God, for which cause we faint not, though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. So, no, so let's say that you're 95 years old and you're just waiting for heaven, and you're and if if you are if you're building your hope on your usefulness to others, what happens when you can't do as much work as you used to do? What happens when, uh, because American culture is obsessed with youth and beauty. What happens when you have no more youth and no more beauty and so nobody will listen to you? Your outward man is perishing. What happens then? But if you, if you spend your life getting ready for heaven, then you'll be in fine shape no matter your age. Amen. For which cause we faint not. He's talking about all the stuff he's going through. And he ain't concerned with that. Though our outward man perish, Yet the inward man is renewed day by day. Spend, spend the rest of your life getting ready for heaven. Lay, lay your treasure up in heaven and not on earth. And you'll always have use for, for the glory of God. God can look at you. Uh, sometimes athletes, I see it all the time at FCA, they wanna, they're always concerned with saying something so that other people will see their Christian life. And we should want that. We should want other people to see us live in the Christian life and glorifying God, them glorifying God because of what they see in us. But you don't need an audience and you don't need a platform to glorify the Lord. You don't need anybody to look at you for God to look at you and be well pleased with you. He's your primary audience. Amen? You don't need people to listen to you to please the Lord. Hopefully they do, but you don't need it. Hopefully you get a chance to testify to the grace of God in your life. But even if you don't, God can be well pleased with you anyway. <laughs> so the question then coming from, from 16, I, I've seen this too. Uh, when, you're, when you're sick and the, the outward man is perishing, do, do you feel the temptation to think that all of life is bad? If, if you're sick, do you feel the temptation to say that, well, surely this means that God's not pleased with me. If you're, if you're beat up physically, if you're exhausted, don't you feel spiritually just drained? Well, let me, let me try to encourage you with this. Be like Paul here who says, Though the outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. Someday you'll receive a body that doesn't get sick or diseased. 
Amen. I don't know if we'll need sleep in heaven or not. I can't imagine why we would. Amen. Anybody know? Are we going to sleep in heaven? Who knows? I don't know. But someday, someday we'll, we'll be out of this body of death. And we'll be, we'll be face to face with the Lord. And let that encourage you while you are in this life, while, you're, while you are in a body that does get sick, while you are in a body that does get diseased. Let the outward man perish, but be renewed in the inner man day by day. In 17, Paul talks about his light affliction. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Paul went through many light afflictions, shipwreck and stonings and beatings and all manner of things. He was whipped 39 times, five times, I think. Five different times he was whipped 39 times. He was shipwrecked multiple times, and he says, for our light affliction. Those things are all found in 2 Corinthians 11, 22 to 30. But he says, For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Don't misinterpret this to say that you have to put yourself through that pain. You don't have to put yourself through that pain. But understand that in the light of eternity, the, thing, the trial that you're going through right now is but light affliction. And if, if you're setting your hope... If you're building your treasure on in this life, in your 401k, Brother Aaron, like you were talking to us about marriage and how the, how the brother was speaking on, on all the different things. If you're, if you're building your hope in this life and your cares are constantly about this life, when you go through something like shipwreck and 39 lashings and beatings, hopefully you don't go through that. But when you go through that, you will not be able to call it light affliction. Because your hope is in this life. If your hope is in the Nebraska football team, when they lose, you'll do what most of the rest of the state does. There's the, the biggest church in, in this state is at one memorial drive. You, you, you can't look to, to an idol to fulfill what only God can, can fulfill. Because when you look to that stuff, you won't be able to, to be like Paul and say, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. 18. While we look not to, at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. So a few questions as we, as we come to the end of the chapter here. What do I do if I am too focused on the, on the temporal? So, I mean, we're all tempted. We're all still human, right? right? Amen? Anybody get tempted? Anybody ever fall? Sometimes we get focused on the temporal. Sometimes we lose sight of the eternal weight of glory. We take our eyes off of Christ. What do we do? We'll call it what it is. What, what does confess mean? If you go into court and you confess to a crime, what are you doing? Admit, you agree. What they say is true. So if I am too focused on the eternal, what should I do? I should confess it. I should admit it and say, Lord, it's true. This stuff doesn't matter like I think it matters. And I, I've put wrong emphasis in wrong places. Forgive me. Confess it and ask the Lord for forgiveness. And First John says that if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us. When we focus on the things that are temporal. Is your inner man being renewed? That's not, a, that's not a given. 16. Though our outward man perish, yet the inner ma inward man is renewed day by day. We spoke for a, a brief moment about uh, the Lord's Prayer. He taught us to give us this day our daily bread. Uh, when the Israelites came out of, out of Egypt, they ate fresh manna every day. This is, this is how the, the inward man is renewed. We, we fellowship with Christ. And, and that's, not a, that's not a given. So if you're focusing on the temporal things, there's a good chance that the inward man's not being renewed. Let us renew ourselves in the grace found in Christ. Like verse 1, Therefore, seeing we have, seen this, we have this ministry, as we've received mercy. Have you received mercy? 
Renew your mind in that. Let the inward man be renewed in the steadfastness and hope found in Christ because of the mercy of Him. A few more questions on this. Where does your heart take delight? And in trouble, where do you go? What's your escape? So you, you face temptation and you're looking for a way out. Do you run to, to food? Do you run to pornography? Do you run to, do you, do you get angry? Do you have an outburst of anger? What's your escape? What are the things that your heart takes delight in? Maybe, maybe you're not, maybe not in a moment of temptation, maybe not in a moment of trial. You, you've kind of, you got a chance to kick your feet up for a minute. What do you take delight in? When you get a chance to, is, is it in temporal things or is it in eternal things? And this is not to say that you can't enjoy the gifts of God, like Nebraska football. You can enjoy that. Go ahead, saints. Enjoy Nebraska football. Maybe not this year, but. <laughs> you can enjoy the gifts of God. You can enjoy a nice, thick steak. Amen. 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 That's real good news, right? That's real good news. You can enjoy the gifts of God, but where, where does your heart take delight? Do you take your greatest delight in Christ? Sometimes it's even ministry. Sometimes we, we're, we're more excited about doing ministry than we are about being in Christ. You remember the time when the disciples come back to Jesus and they say, we can cast out demons. And we can heal people. We can do this. And we're doing this. And we're doing this. And he says, what? Not to, he says, don't, don't rejoice in that, but rejoice in that your name is written in the book of life. Amen. So when God does use you, when God does give you a chance to do ministry, take delight in that. But delight more so in the mercy that you have received. Amen. Don't, don't take delight in Nebraska football or steak primarily or your relationship, or your finances. Don't focus on the temporal, but on the things that are not seen, the things that are eternal. All right, I think this one's appropriate, okay? There's an old story about a pastor who, he calls in sick one Sunday, and, and skips church, and he goes out hunting, and he hears a rustling, and he turns and looks, and a bear starts charging at him, and he skipped church to go hunting. And he cries out, Oh, Lord, make that bear a Christian. <laughs> and the bear, sprinting at him, throws his heels in the dirt. The bear drops to his knees in front of the man, the pastor, skipping church. And the bear says, Lord, thank you for this food I'm about to receive. Well, the only good news in that story is that in time of trouble, that pastor went to the Lord. <laughs> so we talked in, in 2 Corinthians 4 about three things. Okay, The first one was the openness of the gospel and the light that Paul had that shined on Paul, literally. Remember when Paul was blind on the Damascus Road? Light shined onto him, and he knew Christ. Let the, let the light shine from you, knowing that the God of this world has blinded the minds of them that believe not. That's why they don't believe. The second section was talking about the trials that we go through and the purpose of them. And the third section was talking about hope and the temporary and the eternal things. Let your hearts and minds be fixed on the things of eternal worth and value. Having received mercy, received mercy, not just heard about mercy. Let that sink deep into your heart and soul. Having received mercy, then you can give it. Then you can point people to Christ with a smile on your face and let the light of Christ shine through you. Um, I'm grateful to have been here with you. And uh, I, I pray that, that this would sink deeply into your hearts. That having received mercy, mercy you would take delight in eternal things that you would truly see that no matter what's happening in your life god is not caught off guard and paul paul said that uh, in those 
in those trials that he was going through, that he could see that this would result in the glory of God. You don't have to question every little thing in your life, wondering, you know, have I, have I done wrong here? But let, let God be glorified and just walk in faith and keep going in faith, trusting in Christ every step of the way. Let Christ be exalted and no man. <coughs> let me pray. And we'll wrap it up with that. Praise God. Father, you are holy, righteous, and just. And you don't change your mind to then be sometimes merciful and kind and gracious. But you're these things at all times. And Lord, we know that apart from Christ, that leaves us with no hope. We know that apart from Christ, Lord, the only thing left for us is that wrath. But Father, we thank you, Lord, for those of us in Christ, that we have received mercy, that your wrath that was supposed to be for us was poured out on Christ and it has been propitiated and satisfied. There's no more wrath for us. And Father, I pray, Lord, for my brothers and sisters in this room, and Lord, for those that are in the back rooms as well, I pray, Father, that your mercy toward us in Christ would sink deeply into our hearts, that no matter the trials that we go through, that we would see your purpose. I pray, Lord, that we would have hope, always setting our minds on things above and not on temporary things. I pray that we would always be looking to Christ, and not to find our escape or our satisfaction in a moment in something apart from you, but that we would esteem and treasure Christ above all things. And Father, if there be anybody here, Lord, who's listening to this and saying, I don't have the mercy of God, I've not been born again. Lord, I pray that they would see their need for Christ and that they would see him high and lifted up as a wonderful Savior. And I pray that they would <coughs> embrace Jesus. I pray, Lord, that we would all be encouraged to come back to you today and every day, esteeming eternal things above the temporary things. And Lord, we bring this to you in the name of our wonderful Lord and Savior, Jesus, your Son, in whom you're well pleased. Amen.